Hello, welcome. Welcome to the Penn Humanities Forum and uh, live from Standing Rock. Um, I'm Jim English. I direct the forum. I, I'm just going to make a couple of thank yous and then I'll get out of the way. Um, I, want to, I want to thank Patrick Sparrow. Pat, where did you go? Oh, there. Uh, Pat Sparrow is the director of the American Philosophical Society. Um, they are partnering with us to sponsor um, this event as the keynote and kickoff of the conference on um, uh, translating across time and space, which starts now, uh, but continues tomorrow and the next day. Uh, that conference, for anyone who's uh, considering attending part or all of it, is downtown at the APS on Fifth Street, not here in the museum. So don't come here at 8.30 in the morning on tomorrow when they will still be closed. Um, go downtown. But thanks, to, um, thanks to, to Pat and to APS for, their, uh, for partnering us with, uh, with us on this. Also, um, the, uh, the other co-sponsor tonight is the Penn Green Campus Partnership. Is Dan here? And Dan Garofalo, the director of that partnership, um, is a good friend, and, and we thank him for his support. Uh, the event has proved somewhat more logistically complicated than we thought it would be at first. Um, that's for, I think, the good reason that the scale and the stakes of the protest at Standing Rock have, uh, have, have become larger over time. Um, so, so I'm just I'm delighted that, that we're able to, uh, to do the event nonetheless with Winona LaDuc on the screen um, and our other participants and so many of you here uh, to, uh, to, to, to help us. So thank you for coming. Um, the curator and topic director for the whole series on translation this year is my, my friend and colleague in the German department, Bethany Wigan. I'm not going to introduce her except to say, thank you, Bethany. I know this event is near and dear to her heart, and she's going to set up the event for you now. Bethany Wigan. Thanks for being here, and welcome to the Penn Humanities Forum on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania on the western bank of the Schuylkill River. This river's banks are the traditional homelands of the Lenape or the Delaware Indians. If you're a local Philadelphian, you probably know that the river got its present unpronounceable and unspellable name uh, from the Dutch, specifically from the Dutch colonist Anders Corson, who was sent to what was then known as the South River or the Delaware River by Governor Peter Stuyvesant, uh, who was in New Amsterdam, with the intent of opening uh, the River Valley to trade with Europe, um, then currently, and the River Valley was then currently in the hands of the Swedes. The area was famous in Europe for its productive wetlands and especially the birds, which seemed to the Europeans to fall from the skies in a land of plenty. So thick were the rushes in the marshes at the mouth of the Schuylkill River that the Dutch Corson could not see the river's opening and so called it Hidden Stream Schuylkill. The Lenape called this place, called the river, the Tulpehana or the Tulpehoking, the turtle place. Perhaps you know the Septa Tulpa Hawkins Station and the historic district in Germantown. So what I would also like to say to you today is Nulelintam Elepaeek, meaning, I am glad you all came. I learned this phrase from the Lenape Talking Dictionary. The Talking Dictionary has digitized existing audio tapes made with native speakers of Lenape, preserving them and making them freely available on a public site funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, over the course of the conference that you just heard about, we will learn more about the rich array of digital and community-based tools now in use with, and with many more in development across Indian country, sometimes in partnership with universities, historical societies, and archives, including those of the Smithsonian, as well as here in Philadelphia of the American Philosophical Society. Another community-based digital language tool is the Ojibwe People's Dictionary, a searchable, talking Ojibwe English dictionary that features the voices of Ojibwe speakers. As the People's Dictionary website explains, Ojibwe, or Anishinaabe Mowin, is very much a living language, and it is the goal to make the Ojibwe's People's Dictionary a continually expanding resource for the Ojibwe language and culture. 
I am not an Anishinaabe Moan, and it was the People's Dictionary that taught me how to say pushu, which means hello or warm greetings, and pushu especially to Winona Leduc, who will be joining us shortly, and I trust can hear my introduction uh, right now. I'm going to introduce Winona Leduc as well as the other interlocutors who will be joining us shortly on the stage. Um, this event will run, Winona Leduc will speak alone for roughly 20 minutes. We'll then have a, a kind of curated question and answer session, which we hope will be a lively discussion. And then we are optimistic that we will be able to take questions from the audience um, for Ms. Leduc. So Winona Leduc is coming to us today from Standing Rock in North Dakota. She's an internationally well-known author, organizer, and thinker, author of numerous books, um, including this year's Winona Leduc Chronicles, Stories from the Front Lines in the Battle for Environmental Justice. She was raised in Ashland, Oregon, and has made her home for several decades now on the White Earth Indian Reservation. Um, in Anishinaabe Moan, home to the White Earth Band, located in northwestern Minnesota along the Wild Rice and White Earth Rivers. Here, in 1989, Winona Leduc founded the White Earth Land Recovery Project. This nonprofit grassroots organization seeks to recover land for the Anishinaabe uh, Nabeg people and is devoted to building citizen participation in environmental and cultural justice as well as preservation work, to restoring prominent sustainable communities and building renewable energy, media, and youth and leadership development programs. <coughs> In 1993, Winona Leduc founded Honor the Earth to address two primary needs of the native environmental movement, that is, the need to break the geographic and political isolation of native communities and the need to increase financial resources for organizing and change. We will hear soon from Winona Leduc about current developments at Standing Rock involving the continued construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. And I hope we will hear too about native leadership in Minnesota that in August of this year brought the halt of the construction of another Enbridge project, the Sandpiper Pipeline, that had been planned to run from North Dakota's back and oil fields through Minnesota, including the pristine lake country uh, where the wild rice uh, uh, is grown. Winona Leduc is the recipient of countless awards, including Woman of the Year from Ms. Magazine for her work with Honor the Earth and the Reebok Human Rights Award with which she began the White Earth Land Recovery Project. We are truly honored to have her with us today. And I'll just introduce the three other people um, who will be joining me on this stage to talk with Winona Leduc. Professor Marjorie, Professor Marjorie Bruchak, Glad you're here. Several of our panelists have literally flown in like with an hour to spare, so we're really thrilled this is all coming together. Marge Bruchak is a professor in Penn's Department of Anthropology, where she is also the coordinator of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Initiative and chair of the faculty working group on Native American Studies. She conducts restorative research on indigenous collections in Northeastern museums and writes the research blog on the Wampum Trail. Her books include Exercising Anthropology's Demons, Dreaming Again, and she is the co-editor co of Indigenous Archaeologies, a reader in decolonization. Our second uh, panelist will be Elizabeth, historian Elizabeth Ellis, here in the front row. Liz is a citizen of the Peoria tribe of Indians of Oklahoma. Liz deferred taking up her new job as an assistant professor of history at New York University to stay at the McNeil Center for Early American Studies where she holds a Barra postdoctoral fellowship. Like Marge Bruchak, Liz Ellis too is an organizer here in Philadelphia of Philly Solidarity with Standing Rock Sioux Defenders, a coalition of natives and non-natives in solidarity to stop the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. And our third panelist is Erica Violet Lee. Erica comes to us also on an airplane <laughs> about an hour ago. She has graciously traveled to Philadelphia from her native Saskatchewan, uh, actually via Toronto. Um, she is a, um, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Erica. Nehu. Nehu. 
Nehio, sorry, we practiced before, but I totally screwed it up, <laughs> or a Cree student, indigenous feminist and community organizer from inner city Saskatoon. Um, she is part of the Canadian Youth Climate Coalition delegation, and she was at COP21 in Paris, and she will be at COP22 in Marrakesh. She writes about her experience her experiences as an indigenous student navigating the worlds of academia on her wonderful blog, Moontime Warrior, Fearless Philosophizing Embodied Resistance. Erica Violet Lee is a lyrical writer, and in a gorgeous and equally funny and poignant essay, she writes, for example, about attending COM21 in Paris and finding refuge in really loud metal, um, metal music, and she poses what I think are the questions of her generation, one in which indigenous students are particularly implicated, but which I hear echoed all the time among my students. My question is, this is Erica's question, how do I force myself to be patient in the face of constant devastation? Why would I slow down when I might not get the chance to grow older? So this afternoon, Erica, we will not, unfortunately, let you or ourselves slow down. First, we will, however, turn things over right away to Winona LaDuke. Thank you. OK, good. I need to know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to so thanking you and Anishinaabe Moen um, again for the honor of being here with you today. I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to be with you. Thank you for allowing me to, to be with you remotely. I, I really could not leave uh, this place where I'm at right now. But uh, to, as, and, and thank you for the gracious introduction and for all who are there. Um, as I was said, I'm Anishinaabe from the White Earth Reservation. I'm Bear Clan. And um, I did spend a lot of time fighting one pipeline, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And I, I'm here at Standing Rock today. So as I reflected on what I wanted to talk with you about, um, you know, the, the topic that I'm going to address is, you know, first I must give a, a, a little bit of an apology because I'm not a linguist. My son is a linguist, actually. His name is Oshawa Kaprashisit. Maybe in a couple years he'll come visit with you on this same subject. Um, but he is far, has far more command of, of the work of restoration of indigenous languages than I do, and that is, that is his field of work uh, throughout North America. Um, but having said that, what I'm going to talk to you about is this question of where it is we are going, you know, under the general framework of what would Sitting Bull do? What would Sitting Bull do? And I want to say that at this moment in time, in our Anishinaabe prophecies, we are told that we have a choice between two paths. Those, those ancestors and prophets came to us a long time ago. And what they said was that um, at a certain point, known as the time of the seventh fire, the Anishinaabe people would have a choice between two Mikana, two Mikana paths. One path, they said, would be well-worn, but it would be scorched. The other path, they said, would not be well-worn and it would be green. And it would be our choice upon which path to embark. And I believe that that is where we are as Anishinaabe people, but I believe that that is really, really where we are in North America and in this world. We live in this moment where we are the people who are here now. We are the people who, at a spiritual level, at a physical level, at every level, have this opportunity to do the right thing. And it is our moment, which is in part why I am here. So let me tell you a little bit about what it is like. You know, I am, uh, I am someone who lives to the east of what is known as North Dakota, or what I would call Dakota, Lakota, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara territory, the Missouri River territory, which really is its own territory unto itself. I live to the east of here, and you know, I, I, I come here often, and for many, many years, I have been working hard to try to stop bad things from happening in North Dakota. And I say that because what happens is, is that most Americans do not pay attention to North Dakota. What has happened is that over the past 50 years, there has been a consistent depopulation of North Dakota, with more people moving out than, than being li living here and moving in. And so you have seen much of the state return to what is known as a frontier status. In fact, it was so, so remarkable that a couple of guys from Rutgers University, Frank and Deborah Poppers, created this book called The Buffalo Commons, which suggested basically that in light of the demographics of North Dakota, 
the number of farm aid loans, and the ecological disaster of the fossil fuel, agriculture, and cattle industry, we should probably just pull up the fences and return to Buffalo. And so I'm going to kind of start with that as a premise, because that in itself is really where I think we should be going. But what I want to say is, is that most Americans do not pay attention to this region. I know because I live here. In fact, you all call it the Midwest. And I think that that's a really gross misnomer, misnomer, because I feel like, what does the Midwest mean? It is the mid of what West? What does that mean? That's a really bizarre, bizarre thing to name something. I would call this the Northern Great Plains, is what I would call this. It's a geographic area, the center of which is the Pahasapa, or the Black Hills. And the Missouri River, the Great River, which crosses it, is, is the longest river in the United States. So I say that, and what I say is that here we are in, in 2016, and because people have flown over North Dakota for the past 25 years, it is depopulated. They've flown over pretty much and said, hey, there's North Dakota. Or maybe they've flown over and said, hey, look, there's Fargo. That's that city that they, they, they named that funny movie after. They haven't really been here. Nobody has come here. And so in the absence of anybody coming here, there is a dearth of civil society, which has occurred here. What I mean is, is that the, the, the state has run amok in terms of its legislative and governance policy. Indigenous people have been treated very poorly for the past 50 years in this state. And today what we are seeing is that that is still continuing to be true. But we have a state which, it, which is unchecked in its government policies. In fact, the process is called, I believe, regulatory capture, which is when oil companies and Monsanto write all of your legislation. Now, we could all make the case that that's happening nationally with things like the Halliburton Amendment to the Energy Bill, which allowed for fracking in places like Pennsylvania and has allowed, in fact, um, energy corporations to not have to disclose the 602 chemicals that they push into our aquifer systems. But what I would say is that North Dakota is a little bit of a, a fiefdom unto itself. And at this point, we believe it has pretty much become the Mississippi of the North. And that is, I think, what you are seeing here. It is this moment of reckoning that we are all facing. So let me talk about that. So here it is. It's 2016, and the weight of corporate American interests have come to the Missouri River, the Mother River. This time, instead of the 7th Cavalry or the Indian police dispatched to assassinate Sitting Bull, it is Enbridge and the Dakota Access Pipeline. In mid-August, the Standing Rock Tribal Chairman, Dave Archambo II, was arrested himself by state police, along with 27 others for opposing the Dakota Access Pipeline. In the meantime, North Dakota Governor Dapplemeyer has called for more police support. At this point, $7.8 million, and I'm surprised that the Philadelphia Police Force has also not arrived here yet, because everybody else <laughs> seems to be here. You're driving down these really remote rural roads in North Dakota, and you're seeing policemen from Wisconsin here. So it's a, kind of an unusual moment. Every mo and, and what is happening is, is that every major pipeline project in North America must in fact cross indigenous lands or Indian country. And that has become a problem for them. If you drive west of Fargo, that is a road rarely taken by most Americans. What you see is something that I'm going to tell you. Just let me try to have you imagine this. So this is the homeland of the Hunkpapa Ocheti, the Standing Rock Reservation, the, the homeland of the Lakota people, the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara people. If you close your eyes, if you close your eyes, you can imagine the 50 million buffalo that once were in this territory, the single largest migratory herd in the world. You can perhaps imagine, just as Bethany said, the, the large, large flocks, millions, millions of passenger pigeons which would travel through these areas. You can imagine that when those animals moved in sequence or when those birds flew, they changed the dynamics of an ecosystem. The pounding of the hooves of the buffalo would vibrate the earth and make the grass grow. There were once in this territory 250 species of grass, root systems up to eight feet in depth and an ecosystem that, was, that, would, that would carry all of that life. Today, the buffalo are gone. 
They have been replaced by 28 million cattle who require grain, water, and hay, a lot of fossil fuels. Many of the fields are now in a single GMO crop full of so many pesticides and herbicides that the monarch butterflies are wiped out along with all life forms. I have this theory, which is that you should not put things that end in side on your food, because after all, side is a word or a part of a word in suicide, homicide, and genocide. And only a fool would put things that end in side in your food system. But in my memory, that old world remembers, rem remains. If you drive long enough across North Dakota or our territory, you come to the Missouri River called Minnesota. It is a great swirling river of the Lakota, and she is a force to be reckoned with. She is breathtaking. In the time before Sitting Bull, the Missouri River was the epicenter of northern agriculture, something like the, the, the Nile River Valley. The river bed was so fertile that if upon that, most of the northern agricultural crops, corn, beans, squash, melons, all existed in, 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 in so, such immensity that the trade from that region was throughout the territory. That was then. That was then before the treaties. That was then before the smallpox epidemics that wiped out 95% of the Manda and Hidatsa and Arikara people. Their language is almost disappearing with them. That was before the theft of Lakota lands, after the 1868 treaty, the theft of the Black Hills, as part of, in part, a retaliation against Sitting Bull's victory at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And in a time prior to Black Lives Matter or Native Lives Matter, Great leaders like Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse were assassinated at the hands of police. One thing that we know is that our people, all of our indigenous people, and in particular the Lakota people, have survived much. Forced into the reservation life, the Lakota attempted to stabilize their society. That is until the dams. In 1944, the Pick Sloan Project put up for white farmers and ranchers, flooded out the Missouri River tribes, taking the best bottom lands from the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara people, those who created most of the world's agrobiodiversity of the Western Hemisphere, and also took the lands of the Dakota and the Lakota. Over 200,000 acres on the Standing Rock and Cheyenne River reservations in South Dakota were flooded by only one of those dams, the Oahe Reservoir. That itself forced not only their relocation, but the loss of much of their world. The Garrison, Oahe, and Fort Randall dams created reservoirs that eliminated 90% of the timber and 75% of the wildlife on those reservations. Now that is how a people are made poor. Add to that the fact that all of those native people who tried to eke out a living as farmers or ranchers upon their remaining lands with lost access to manage their water were denied loans by the US Department of Agriculture. And it was not until this year that final settlements began in cases similar to the black farmers case, but known as the Keeps Eagle lawsuit for all of those native people, particularly in the Northern Plains who never could get a loan and never could get access to their lands. So in the meantime, the vast majority of tribal lands have been leased out to non-Indian landholders in these reservation territories. So it is not surprising that today, two thirds of the population of Standing Rock is below the poverty level. It is not surprising that Indian arrest rates are 11 times that of non-Indian people in, in North Dakota. It is not surprising that our diabetes rate is one third of our people have diabetes. It is not surprising that the infrastructure on our reservations is pretty close to third world in what is a first world country. So what remains for us is little, our tenacity, our commitment, our culture, our language, our land, 
and the mother river. The mother river is what remains, that's a constant. And that is what is threatened today. So as it is said, I spent four years fighting a pipeline known as the Sandpiper. Enbridge, the largest oil pipeline company in North America, was bound and determined to run a huge pipeline from, from Clearbrook, Minnesota to Superior, Wisconsin. Superior being the furthest inland port in the Great Lakes and something coveted by many oil companies. For four years, I attended almost every regulatory hearing. I worked with my tribal governments and non-Indian landowners to mount a challenge to that oil company. And after four years of regulatory hearings, four years of attending every hearing, four years of pushing them outside of the box, because in fact, what we know is that the box does not work for us as native people. States continually deny nation to nation consultation processes and denied us even in the hearing process to present our cases. Well, we, we had our own regulatory hearings as tribes. And what I know is that four years later, after our fourth sacred ride, our fourth sacred ride on the proposed pipeline route, the ride against the current of the oil, one day after we finished that, the Enbridge Company announced that they were going to cancel their plans for the Sandpiper, 640,000 barrel per day, fracked, fracked oil pipeline through the heart of our wild rice beds. They announced that they were going to cancel that project. That was a very great... And so what I want to say is that bad projects can be beaten. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But what I also know is that the day after they announced that they were going to cancel our project, they announced that they had purchased one third of the DAPL project, Dakota Access Pipeline Project, because Marathon Oil and Enbridge had promised their shareholders that they would provide a pipeline to them by the end of 2016. And so they looked to the West and they saw a pipeline that was about 70% built. And they thought, we'll do that. And so what has happened is, is that that pipeline is barrel, barreling towards the Missouri River from both the East and the West. It is barreling towards the Missouri River. It is complete in states like Illinois. It is 90% complete in Iowa. I believe it is about 90% complete in South Dakota. It is following almost the same exact route as the Keystone XL pipeline. So this is the Keystone XL pipeline, but it's not called the Keystone XL pipeline. And then it came to Standing Rock. Now what has happened here is, is that this pipeline is uh, 570,000 barrels a day of Bakken crude oil. And along with that, if you're going to have it go all the way through, you're going to get 245,000 metric tons of carbon daily, pretty much enough to assist in the combusting of the planet to oblivion. So uh, they've been pushing it. You know, they've been really pushing it hard. And so the Standing Rock tribe has tried to oppose them. But what has happened is, is that in this country, it would be called regulatory capture. But the federal government has decided that um, it would use a different section of the um, federal law, the Army Corps of Engineers. And that federal law um, would mean that instead of issuing a 404 permit and requiring a full environmental impact statement <clears throat> on the pipeline. Hold on a second. So instead of doing a full environmental impact statement, they did this other thing. Uh, which is called a nationwide permit. So without getting too technical, but it's pretty important for all of us, is that, see, under the law, a 404 permit, the Army Corps of Engineers must provide, for instance, notice and opportunity for public hearings to evaluate the project's impact pursuant to the National Environmental Policy Act. Now, that's the act that keeps, for instance, your drinking water clean and poisons out of the air in residential communities. That didn't happen. What happened is, is that instead, the Army Corps of Engineers used this regulation called the nationwide permit process, which is intended for minor, minor pipeline projects, kind of like if you had a pipeline from your school to the sewer system, like that. That's what that's required. That's what that is for. Or projects that would, in, would result in up to a half acre loss of waters. So what happened is, is that uh, they've been pushing through this process. On Monday of this week, which we call Indigenous Peoples Day, but apparently the Enbridge Corporation 
still believes is is Columbus Day because they were not there when we went to see them. Um, what happened is, is that uh, the Army Corps began segmenting, segmenting massive interstate pipeline projects like DAPL by artificially creating uh, treating the thousands of water crossings as separate projects, which would each qualify for a nationwide permit number 12. In this way, the Corps approved a 1,168-mile pipeline without any review process. We wrote a letter, uh, went out on Monday, saying it is time to review this again. That was the first problem. The second problem, uh, and this is called regulatory capture, as I said, when corporations write your policies for you. The second thing that happened is, is this problem of desecration. So on Friday, September 2nd, the day before the Labor Day weekend, the Standing Rock tribe submitted to the court detailed findings of rare cultural sites, which include 27 graves, stone prayer rings, and other sacred artifacts directly on the proposed pipeline route place that had not yet been impacted. There's about 380 archeological sites that face desecration. So what happened is, is that early the next morning, that would be Saturday, the 3rd of September, Dakota Access DAPL responded by bringing in construction crews and bulldozing the specific areas described by Standing Rock in their filing. When the protectors of the site entered the construction area, private security guards attacked them with dogs and pepper sprays. So what has happened out here is that our people have been marginalized and called protesters and acting as if we are outlaws. But what I would suggest to you is that in fact, you have a rogue corporation operating under a state of rogue regulations. And, and while this is something that is happening in North Dakota, what I'm gonna suggest to you that you know, which I'm sure you will understand is that this could happen anywhere. And that it happened here is in part because nobody has ever checked in on North Dakota. One of the questions that might be asked in North Dakota is what exactly can a private security firm do? Can a private security firm that is allowed to put dogs on people also waterboard people? <laughs> what can a private security firm do in North Dakota? And exactly, exactly how far are they willing to go um, to push this pipeline? And that is really a civil society question in the era we are in, and I will get back to that. And finally, there's this question of what exactly is fair. On August 18th, the Bismarck Tribune uh, revealed that the Dakota Access Pipeline Project had routed the pipeline through Standing Rock's lands and under its drinking water supply to avoid jeopardizing the drinking water supply of Bismarck, North Dakota, the state capital. The paper reported, quote, in the early planning process, Dakota Access considered crossing the Missouri River about 10 miles north of Bismarck, but rejected that option due to the costs associated with the proximity of wellhead source water protection areas of municipal water supply well. Instead, the pipeline went upstream from the main drinking water intake of the Lakota. So this is an environmental justice problem, but this is also a problem of systemic racism in North Dakota, where they feel as if it is okay to treat native people as second-class citizens in their state. So I feel like the fact is, is that in this moment in time, we are looking at a rogue corporation in a rogue regulatory system. And that is in part why we are here. We are also here because, you know, this is this time when we need to decide what we are doing and which way we are going. Because what I am looking at is the fact that th we have a river that I would suggest has a right to live. This pipeline, as well as the practices which have been going on over the past 10 years in North Dakota of fracking, of discharge of uh, lots of mm, fracking waste. Like for instance, this last year, 3 million um, th this year, 3 million gallons of salt water with elevated levels of chloride went into the Missouri River, one after another after another. But North Dakota's health director, David Glatt, didn't expect it to harm wildlife or drinking water supplies because the water was diluted. You know, there's this old saying at the Environmental Protection Agency I heard one time, which was, 
the solution to pollution is dilution. That's not true. <laughs> the solution to pollution is to not make the pollution in the first place. Um, so, you know, it is one thing after another. And, you know, you don't need the whole pipeline lecture on that these are not safe. But what I want to say is, is that this is this moment in time. Um, over the past three weeks, you know, I've been out here a lot. Um, I just rode my horse up against the current of the oil. Three of my horses went and we rode to Tioga, the place of the proposed um, outlet for the oil along the proposed pipeline route. But what I have seen in the short time that I'm here is a determined people, very determined, coming from everywhere because, you know, people see what is going on and they know what is right and what is wrong. And so we are joined. You know, there are indigenous people here, but there are all kinds of people here. I've interviewed a lot of people and, um, you know, they've come to stand with us. But what I know is, is that, you know, as we hold in our determination, the state of North Dakota continues to go more and more rogue. So there's probably about 130 people who have been arrested here, you know, and they have been arrested on charges which keep escalating. You know, perhaps the most prominent arrest and most entertaining arrest was, of course, the arrest of Amy Goodman, a journalist who was charged with trespassing. And they did issue a, I believe they did issue a warrant for her. Um, when I talked to, you know, when I read the Bismarck paper yesterday morning, the cover story on the, on the paper was pipeline work continues. And then right under that was Amy Goodman's hearing coming up. Discussion will be if Amy Goodman is actually a journalist. <laughs> so I was looking at that thinking, you know, how out of touch can you get, North Dakota? Apparently, you've been not watching any national TV. And apparently, you have no idea of the command or the idea of the First Amendment rights. But the second thing I want to say is, is that North Dakota has now $7.8 million in military aid. You have seen some of the pictures, I'm sure. Um, there is really no reason to have a mine-resistant armored personnel carrier, known as an MRAP, up here on a rural North Dakota road. These, the people that are here are committed to nonviolence, and yet their charges are getting trumped and escalated. So you have people praying in a teepee that are charged with rioting. We have felony rioting charges coming down on more and more people each day as North Dakota escalates its behavior. And so it is this moment in time. You know, I feel like this is the moment of, you know, whether it is Selma or, you know, what it is. This is a moment in our movement where we need to decide what we are going to do. And what is happening in North Dakota is that there are courageous people who are here. There are courageous people and we seem to have the numbers to be charged because if it was just me and my family, we'd be in jail still and just a few of us, you know? But there are many, many people who are here committed to nonviolent direct action. And those numbers will continue to be here. Winona. To me, this is this moment in time for civil society because we live in an era, you know, where indigenous people hang on as hard as we can to that which we value, whether it is our languages, our ceremonial practice, our sacred sites, or our water. And we do that with a great determination and an understanding that what we have now is our, what our ancestors gave us and what we fight for is what we pass on. You know, that is what is happening here. Right, so what we have is this moment that is occurring here, but it is really this moment in America. We, we live in a country which has vast levels of consumption. You have infrastructure which is crumbling, a country which has a D in infrastructure, where gas mains explode in cities and bridges collapse, a D in infrastructure. But yet we are looking at, in North America, maybe $50 billion of new pipeline proposals. What we say here in our territory and at Standing Rock is that instead of you know, $7.8 million in military aid, we should have $7.8 million of solar and wind. And what we say is that instead of trying to shove a pipeline down our throats, what we really want is pipes to go to places like Flint, Michigan that deserve them. In our teachings, this is this prophecy time where you have a choice between two paths. And from our perspective, this is this moment that is absolutely clear that in this moment, we have a choice between t these two paths. And, and the people here are clear upon which path they are going to embark. And we are hoping, we are hoping that other people will not be only vigilant in their support, 
of this very, very remote and, and looked past for decades territory in North America, but will also take up those struggles in their own communities at this moment that we have now. Miigwech, thank you for your time. Okay, great. So we have been circulating our questions, um, talking with one another via email, and um, are really, um, we're gonna try and keep it pretty casual. Um, but this is a new format for us, so bear with us as we go forward. We're going to ask questions um, for about 20 minutes, have a conversation with Winona LaDuke, and then we'll um, turn the mics over to you. Marge will get us started. So I literally just flew in from Arizona from the gathering of the Association of Tribal Libraries, Archives, and Museums. It was the first international conference for that group. And as a closing act, we gathered in a circle, sent a prayer to the Dakotas, and literally all of us signed a sheet that was as wide as this stage offering support. And so that builds into this question that I have, which is that increasingly, indigenous peoples around the world are not only stepping up for this concern, but are starting to build global networks to promote sovereignty, to reclaim cultural heritage, to reclaim control of indigenous territories. and what I often struggle with, and what I think many of us struggle with, is what can we do in our communities? What can we do in the academy? And is the way that we work in the academy changing the conversation enough? So is, yeah. what, we're, is what we're doing in the academy actually making a difference? And from your experience, what can we do? I, I feel that sometimes it's our responsibility to train up the next generation to be ready to grapple with these causes. But I'd like to know from your experience how you think about those separate worlds, the activism on the ground, the intellectual agency in the academy, and the international gatherings of people. Thanks for your question um, okay. very much. I, um, I would say that you know, it is a balance between all of them. You know, one of the greatest pleasures I've had out here at the camp, to be honest, is you know, I, I walk around, I, got, you know, I, I stay down there off and on, but I walk around and uh, there are a lot of young people they come to me and say, you talked at my school. You know, I remember you, you talked at my grade school or you talked at my university. And so, you know, this, this idea of, uh, you know, critical thinking in academia uh, is essential to, to the work that we need to do. Um, you know, so keep training Native scholars, but in, keep training Native people. But, you know, I feel like that academia also does a disservice um, too many of us, you know, I've obviously spent a lot of time in school, but, you know, it, in, in kind of the entrenched privileging of knowledge and this option, which I, you know, I think you are in part getting at is that, you know, academia is where it all is. You know, the fact is, is that things are moving very fast, fast in, in, in the field outside of academia. So I, I don't have, you know, most of us don't have time to wait for someone to finish the PhD on this. Uh, we're going now. <laughs> You know, and so make sure that your students are allowed lots of field work and they get credit for it. I'm sitting in a room with a couple of young students from Evergreen State, my friends Olton Grossman students, and they're getting credit for being out here. You know, don't you know? Don't think so entrenched in academia that that what you have is uh, so much you know so much powerful because it is a, a, a very important, but also sometimes what is going out in the field you know in our territory is also really important. Um, is that answer your question, Marge? Thank you. I would love it. Maybe if Erica, you want to jump in at this point. You and I had a conversation earlier that goes straight to the heart of this discussion. Tanse Erica Violet Nipsigasan Nisaskatomane Kinitotsen. It's kind of echoey. Uh, I'm from Saskatchewan, which is Treaty Six Neheo Metis Homeland Territory. Um, across this colonial border that actually is not a line. If you drive through it, there's no, there's no giant line separating our um, territory. That's all Plains territory. Uh, I spent some time in Standing Rock, uh, and it was really beautiful. It's about a 10-hour drive from where I am, where my home is in Saskatoon. Uh, I'm a philosophy student, which is part of why I'm here. Uh, as, although we have a huge indigenous population of students in Saskatchewan, um, obviously philosophy is a very white discipline. Uh, basically, I spent my, la the, my whole undergrad degree, which I'm just nearing the end of, fighting for basically recognition within the framework of philosophy, which I've now realized is kind of stupid. 
Um, and I love critical thought, and I remember reading so much of Winona LaDuke's stuff as a student, a young indigenous student, thinking, oh my gosh, it's another indigenous woman up there doing philosophy. And then when I walked into a classroom or looked for representation in philosophy, um, it was nowhere, right? It's only white men, Europeans, that's what philosophy is. Native people don't have thought. We don't have legal orders. We don't have complex thought systems. Um, and so indigenous studies for me, in, in Canada at least, and I know I have friends. I have a friend who's sitting in the room next to Winona LaDuke right now who also goes to Evergreen. Hi, Caro. Um, and you know, <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, yeah, so, uh, and you know, as like two-spirit, queer, femme, awesome, radical, young native women, we, uh, we realize now that academia can't contain us. It can't, it can't um, serve what we need because when we're asked to go into classrooms and forget that our territory is being logged, that there's oil spills happening in the river down, like down right across from my university, um, you know, that's not, that's not a place I want to be. That's not where real philosophy happens, I think. That's great. Do you want to, um, Winona, do you want to address those concerns or? Yeah, I mean, I just, I just want to say, you know, thank you for what you're saying and for your, for your discipline and your work. I mean, you know, it is, uh, it, I, I cannot just, you know, I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, I remember this one native guy I went to school with. I was an undergraduate at Harvard, and he was a Apache guy from West Texas. And when they asked, he, you had to fill out on your application for Harvard, or not your application, like what your intended field of study was, or maybe it was when he was already coming in. He put in his intended field of study whites. <laughs> which I thought was super funny. I was like, I guess that is kind of what you study when you go to Harvard. Well, white people think, you know. So, uh, you know, I mean, it is true. It is these universities and, you know, all these tenure tracks and certainly Native professors are very scant in any of these. You know, people who talk about Native people who are not Native are more pre prevalent. You know, and we really need to address that. That needs to be flipped over because obviously indigenous thinkers come from indigenous communities and you can learn about it, but you know, we need to really make sure that our people are able to teach in all arenas. You know, and, and a lot of, you know, um, you know, a lot of my thinking is, you know, foundational. I mean, I'm looking at sy symptoms of the problem here, but the basic foundational thinking of indigenous people, for instance, the teaching of Minopamataziwan, the good life, Minopamataziwan, you know, there's nothing in Minobamadaziwa that has to do with uh, level of income, level of consumption, you know, power over others. The, the idea of the good life is that, you know, this respectful set of relations in a world that is animate, a reaffirmation of our spiritual practice and our cultural practice on a daily basis, you know, with, with, with the natural world and understanding that our relatives have wings and fins and roots and paws and an under, understanding also of something like intergenerational uh, equity is, I guess, what academics call it. But, you know, in each deliberation, you consider the impact upon the seventh generation from now. And, and you know, the teachings of great men like the deceased John Mohawk and others, the fact is, is that, you know, indigenous thinking is, is essential thinking for sustainability. I, I, you know, from what I can see, you know, I don't want to say, but, you know, like you look at a John Locke, he got us here. You know, I was not so helpful in the end. You know, John's like utilit utilitarian practices and, you know, making everything, put your labor to it and make it your own. You know, that's this whole set of anthropocentric assumptions that are not, you know, not acceptable. And so, you know, I feel like that, you know, as, pe as people who are conscious, the creator gave us these, these ability to, you know, different abilities than other relatives that have wings or fins or roots or paws, you know, it is our it is our responsibility and opportunity to to behave, <laughs> to behave, to self censor, to say we're not going to do stuff just because the oil's there doesn't mean we're going to take it out. Just because we could, you know, put our flag on the top of that mountain and call it ours, don't mean we're gonna, you know. So just just you know, to me, uh, the reaffirmation of indigenous scholars, thinking, philosophy is essential in these universities, and it is not just historic practice, it is present practice too, because, you know, cultural pr cultures are vital things. And, you know, our foundational knowledge is in the teachings of our elders and our, you know, and our practices come from that, but it is also vital. We are not, you know, we're not stuck in just one spot. Thank you for your comments though. Anyway, thank you.
Thank you so much for that um, commentary. I want to ask a question about Philadelphia specifically. Um, I think in urban areas, sometimes indigenous people can feel very invisible. Um, it's hard to see community. And so I'm wondering, in light of the recent court decisions, the federal courts have ruled against Standing Rock, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more both about what the next steps for the water protectors and for those out at Standing Rock fighting Dakota Access are, and what somewhere, a community, a city like Philadelphia, how can we stand in solidarity with what so many of us think of as flyover country and this, this part of the country that can feel so remote but that we have really such strong connections to? You know, thanks for your question. I think that, you know, there's uh, several strategies that are proceeding ahead. As I said, the Sierra Club, Honor the Earth and the Indigenous Environmental Network sent a very terse and long, very long letter to the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers saying that they needed to actually do a full environmental impact statement that they had mis, you know, we will go with that they had misinterpreted the federal regulations as opposed to that they had been courted and wooed by DAPL. Um, you know, and so we are hopeful that we will get a full environmental impact statement because a full environmental impact statement would change some things. You know, on, on one level, we could talk about climate change and the whole it is egregious the amount of CO2 that would go in. On another level, we could talk about, you know, the fact that they should not be, they, that under law, they are not allowed to plow through our, our burial sites and our sacred sites. We can talk about the fact that you know, if they were going to put this pipeline in, they should have put it right next to the water supply of the city of Bismarck instead of putting it next to the water supply of the, of the Standing Rock people. You know, so there's a lot of things that, you know, should be discussed. And I think would, you know, if this, this, this pipeline would not pass a full EIS, full environmental impact statement process. And I think that, you know, to be honest with you, in America, very rarely, very rarely, is the no build option exercise, but that is really the precautionary principle, you know, in practice. Precautionary principle is don't do it if it if, unless you can prove it's going to work out, and uh, that has been applied in a number of European countries. And needs to, you know, we need to we need to to change the rogue nature of American legal institutions and regulatory authority. And that's you know kind of a far cry ahead. But what I'm saying is is that in a, in a country which considers corporations as persons under the law, we have a problem with law. In, you know, in, a, in a country which up here, we just saw one of my nephews was arrested and in his felony charges, he was told that he could have no more contact with the victim. When asking who the victim was, they said Dakota Access Pipeline Project. And he said, that's not even a corporation. That's a project that now is considered a victim. You know, so we got a lot of work to do. You know, I'd like to ask you to, you know, to, to, to stay on that process. We need to have the rights of nature and the rights of Mother Earth be higher than the rights of corporations. Those are the kind of things that Philadelphia should do, you know, because you had all that historic constitutional work and stuff. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just saying, y'all do that kind of stuff out there. But, you know, and, you know, I mean, I, I think that there's some other questions, you know, things is that, you know, stay in, in, in touch, you know, continue sending out support. I think we need some more yurts, frankly. I, have, I don't quite have it down, but it's looking a little flimsy and the, and the winter stuff looks good. I'm, but I'm, I'm a parent, so I'm worried about my, my, my people out here and how many yurts you have. Um, but, you know, then, then these, I don't know, Philadelphia has passed like Seattle and Minneapolis. Uh, statements of support for Standing Rock. That'd be a great thing to do. And then look at your own pipeline and fracking problems in Pennsylvania. Y'all don't need a lecture on that. We got plenty of them there. You know, so remember that these fights are all all related. And you know, in all places, corporations that now control the water. You know, this is a problem in all their territories because you cannot drink oil. You cannot drink oil. And so you know, let us be diligent. Don't abstract things out too much and spend too much time on everything else when now would be the time, you know, to make sure that you can drink the water, so. Thank you so much for that. I um, was talking with you before we got started about, um, you mentioned already the name of Zoltan Grossman and some of his students are there with you. Um, when I was preparing for this event, I had the real pleasure of listening to um, one of the episodes of your radio show um, with Zoltan Grossman. It's on PRI. You can live stream it. I really uh, recommend the show to you. 
um, here in the audience. Um, and the question really has to do with um, this, how do we grow the we? You, you, you know, we've heard you speak so eloquently about we need to, and now is the time for us. And um, in that conversation on the radio uh, with Zoltan Grossman, you both discussed um, what Zoltan called unlikely alliances. And I was so, um, you know, really taken with that term. And, um, and I, I wanted to, um, um, to, to ask you to, to talk a little bit more about it. Um, in the show, you and Zoltan talk about how these unlikely alliances have occurred really since the days, since like the earliest days of um, settler colonist and indigenous peoples cooperations actually, often um, to um, block businesses encroachments on, on lands of smaller people, smaller concerns. Um, and the big business, you know, we just heard you say, like, very much um, supported by the federal government at this point. But um, can you talk a little bit about some of the particularly successful examples of these unlikely alliances? Um, we know some in, in historically, of course, here in Pennsylvania. Um, but what are some that have been particularly effective in preserving both culture and lands? And um, it's a big question, but how can we create more of them? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, I mean, I did give you the case study that I just did in uh, northern northern Minnesota of uh, fighting the pipeline, the sandpiper, and that was an unlikely alliance because a lot of those northern lakeshore owners uh, were a little reluctant to be with native people, and we had a number of like you know go arounds on that because they're like you know we don't really want to talk about treaty rights, and we're like well okay well let's just. Uh, Let's just work on this. And now they come around, you know, but it took them a long time because they're afraid of our treaties. And I was like, those are agreements made between our ancestors. And they are also the law. And that has helped a lot in our case here. You know, uh, Wisconsin, the defeat of a giant GTAC mine proposal. Uh, I know Zoltan was sad he wasn't there for that battle, you know, but that was a big uh, iron taconite mine proposal that they wanted to put just north and that was again uh, native and non-native people in Wisconsin they're looking at a similar battle along the uh, proposed route of the uh, 66 a big Enbridge line that will barrel through Wisconsin if they're able to construct its next round um, you know I've, I've had a lot of experience in these you know because I do believe we all need to work you know very much together in uh, you know and where we are going in this um, I'm trying to think of the rest of your question. That was like on these alliances, then you're talking about. Maybe how to, how to create more. Oh, how to create more. Oh, I know. Okay. Oh, and I actually had a suggestion. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm thinking about this all the time, you know, as you can imagine, because we really need to win these battles, you know, and this is really a showdown out here. And I feel like that, you know, what I have to say is, is that, and, and I, some people may, may think this is a, a foolish idea, but, you know, there's a lot of people, 125, there'll be 150 or 170 people that are going to be, that are charged. And their court appearances are in December and January and February out here. And to be, you know, let's just be honest, most people don't want to go to North Dakota in December and January and February, which is why they're setting those trials now. And so I think you need something like the Freedom Riders. I think you need people to start coming out here. And I think you need people to bear witness to North Dakota's uh, rogue regulatory process and they're demonizing of, of people who are trying to stand for the water. And I think people, you know, people have come from everywhere to join with the people at Standing Rock, but I think we need to continue that. And then over the course of the next year, you know, I'd really like to see, you know, I'm down there at the camp and there's like the experts in like sustainable building and permaculture and the midwives. We had a baby born at the camp yesterday, you know, and we have all these gifted people that have come here and they're at the camp. You know, they're holding it down in the camp. But the fact is, is that with a good coordinated plan, the fact is, is that the that Standing Rock Nation should be solar. Standing Rock Nation should have sustainable housing. The Standing Rock Nation should have, you know, more holistic health care. And so I feel like this, you know, this moment is to, 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 to do something right. And this is, this is the place, um, you know, whether it's like, I used to think about those things called the Vence Ramos Brigades or the people who would go to Chiapas to help down there. I think you need that out here, you know, something like that. But it has to be really well organized, and it cannot be a lot of church people, because it's very gets to be a headache a lot of times. Uh, 
I mean, you can come if you're all church people too, but just don't carry all that stuff with you, okay? <laughs> Winona, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you to go in a very related but slightly different direction, related in terms of how indigenous people think about language and land and history and culture, but it may seem like a diversion for people who are thinking about political action. Coming from Gila River community in the Southwest, I was recognizing how in that desert landscape, those indigenous people have known how to manage that land for millennia. And their oral traditions talk about coming out of the land, not of migrating from somewhere else, not of hunting big game and, and absent-mindedly stopping somewhere because the weather changed, but of literally knowing that landscape inside out, knowing that ecosystem inside out for millennia. But as with virtually every indigenous nation across the continent, they have been subjected to settler colonial policies that change the landscape, change the land, force them to relocate. But yet they find ways to rebuild and recover. And so I found myself thinking that, you know, I'm a northern woodlands people, Ill person. I know how to survive in the forest. I have no idea how to survive in the desert. I have no idea how to survive on the plains. But what is coming out of this moment in time that's helping Great Plains people recover who they are and where they are? And how can we encourage them in that? And what can they share with us that might help other people think about who they are, where they are, what is that place, what is that tradition, what is that landscape, and how can those places be preserved? I think, you know, I think that's a really good question. I mean, what I've seen here, like, I, you know, I haven't been to a lot of them, but there's a lot of ceremonial practice at the camp. And, you know, people are bringing their different ceremonies in to, to reaffirm, you know, because our spiritual practice keeps us strong. You know, and even us, we rode for four days on our horses, you know, and I prayed all the time when I was on that horse, you know, that, that you know, for, for our land and for our water and for our, uh, all our relatives and, you know, to keep that, that, that bad away from us. And so... You know, there's this, you're, you are right that there is, you know, this, that strengthening and supporting the restoration and the protection of Native spiritual practice and Native cultural practice is really, you know, very important. I mean, this country was founded on precepts of religious freedom, but it was not until 1978 with the passage of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act that Native religions were not outlawed. And so, you know, to me, uh, you know, we still take a big hit, you know, the Apache down there, you know, at Oak Flats, trying to have their ceremonies they had since time immemorial there, you know, their women's coming of age ceremony are being told that their, their, their right to do that or their ability to continue their traditions is obscured by the interests of a mining company facilitated by John McCain. You know, I mean, there is case after case after case after case that continues today. And so, you know, to me, um, you know, we work hard. Like I said, I have one son who is a linguist. You know, my other children are cultural practitioners, but no one is like as prolific as him in the study of linguistics and the restoration of language. You know, but in, in our case, you know, what we, what you, you know, we need to be able to, to do both. We need to be able to restore and strengthen things uh, while we live in, in, in our places that are sacred. And here, you know, looking out here and, and you know, uh, a couple of days ago, I had the opportunity to be in a Mandan Earth Lodge. And that earth lodge is made out of giant cottonwood trees. It is a, a circle in, in shape and it's kind of domed at the top and it is covered entirely with earth. And, uh, you know, it is so thick. It's so thick and so large, you know, that, that, that those families would live in there all winter and they would often bring, uh, they would even have some lodges that would be for their horses or they would have the horses in the lodge with them. And they, you know, had developed architectural strategies to, to meet the cold of North Dakota. And, you know, maybe this, this, the, the small time version is a yurt on the public lands. But what I'm saying is, is that the knowledge of indigenous communities on how to, you know, live in an ecosystem, how, how to farm with crops that belong in an ecosystem. Uh, you know, I specialize in Northern Flint varieties that have a very uh, short growing season and, and are uh, wind and frost resistant. Um, you know, all of that is essential to the thinking of sustainability in the future. And, you know, there's a lot of indigenous knowledge of, on sustainability. And, and you know, the, the thing that, you know, is always is 
you know, the way to do that, though, is to support us in the restoration of that knowledge and come visit us as it is restored, not extract the knowledge from us and, and live us, leave us in third rate technology and the, the inability to capitalize and still facing giant beasts and monsters of industrial society. You know, so to me, it's this opportunity for partnerships. And those partnerships and Standing Rock is a place where that's going to happen. A lot of people are interested in solar here, are interested in these traditional lodging and building structures. And I'm hoping that we see all that, you know, happen here. But people need to, you know, work on that, too, because, at, you know, these in the level of D um, of the, you know, D development, you know, or underdeveloping, underdeveloping as, you know, as the practice that has occurred for the past 500 years and continues today as, as every asset that we have is stolen from us or taken from us or wrested from us or made illegal or parted away. You know, we need to ensure that our wealth, our cultural wealth, our spiritual wealth, or the wealth of our water, you know, our agricultural wealth remains because that is what gives our language and our life our vitality. So I know both Erica and Liz have a quick question for you, Winona, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, Erica, you want to go shoot first? Uh, I liked, in the beginning of your talk, you talked about a return to the frontier and North Dakota as a flyover state, as a, as a state and a place that is looked past. And I think, like I said, I'm from Saskatchewan, and people, Saskatchewan is sort of the joke. Like, Saskatchewan is the word that they'll say when they mean, like, the middle of nowhere. Um, let's go to Saskatchewan, in the middle of nowhere. That's where I'm from. And uh, in the north of Saskatchewan right now, what's happening is uh, my friend Sylvia McAdam, who I'm sure you know, uh, we work with Idle No More together, uh, is defending her lands in the north from loggers, and it's like being clear cut completely. Um, this is sort of conceived of as a wasteland. It's looked at as, um, it's almost like terra nullius. And then the industry came in and said nothing productive is being done to this land. So they wiped it out. They made it productive in, uh, in Locke's terms. And then now it's a, it's a devastated landscape. And indigenous people are the, are the only ones there to protect it and to renew it, to restore it, to protect what's left. Um, if you go down from that logging, you'll hit the river, the uh, Kitsikashiwa Nisipi, the Saskatchewan River, which was devastated by an oil spill. If you go a little bit more north, or a little bit more south, that's the site of the Northwest Rebellion and Louis Riel's resistance in the prairies. Um, and a little bit more south is where a, a young boy, a Cree boy called uh, Colton Bushi, was shot and killed by a farmer for trespassing on his property um, just recently. And you go a little bit more south and you hit, uh, you hit Cannonball River, you hit St Sacred Stone Camp. I'm wondering, um, so in the context of all of these, the plains and the prairies and people saying like, this is flyover territory, this is wasteland, there's no resistance here, when it seems to me actually there's a ton of resistance. So how do you see that complete erasure, that complete ignorance of this vast plain area and uh, what do you th how do you think that gives us revolutionary potential? What do you see at Standing Rock that gives you hope? I mean, to me, at Standing Rock, you see people, you know, that'd be enough. <laughs> that'd be enough. We're done. And, you know, I, I mean, I've seen that in my own community. And, you know, but we were, we were a little more prepared. And we had a little bit more, uh, you know, we, we, we'd already gone through a couple of big battles on this stuff. And so I, have to, I would say my community was quick, quick to summon and, and uh, you know, to turn out. And we did not have so many variables against us in terms of the regulatory capture. Of major corporations you know but these community this community is a tough community and it's very resilient and it is a moment when we really need to support them and to make sure that the tribe has a financial backing to ensure that they are able to care for their people and the people who have come to visit them and then also the legal counsel that they will need and then as well the organizations but it is this moment in time for sure you know as you spoke of louis real i'm a big fan of louis real if someone could be a fan can you be a fan of louis real Yes. Anyway, he is, he is one of my, you know, one of my, my, my most amazing people that I think often of, you know, and, and, you know, for those who do not know, but he was a Métis patriot, you know, and as he may judge by my, my last name, I'm part Métis myself, Leduc's, Leduc is not an Ojibwe name, <laughs> as a matter of fact, but my relatives came from Manitoba, Leduc's came from Manitoba when they were Métis and they married into my community many years ago. And I often think, what would Louis do? 
If, if Louis' vision of a multiracial democracy had prevailed in Manitoba, you know, during the time that he spoke for that, and the time that he joined the Métis people and, you know, the Native people and then joined by the Irish people against Lord Selkirk and, the, and those who were the colonial practices that came out of England, it would have been a different province. It would have been a different province then. And instead, he was hung as a traitor, as you know. And it was 100 years after his hanging as a traitor, 110, I believe, that Louis Riel was declared a provincial hero <laughs> in Manitoba and is you know, considered to be one of the fathers of Manitoba. And it's so ironic that you, know, you, you must be hung before you are considered to be worthy. And so to me, it is, it is a territory that has been fought for hard by people. And the absence of interest intellectually and in terms of coverage does not mean we do not exist, because we know that we exist. We know where what is called, they call it the medicine line, because back in the day, flee if they cross that line, the cavalry would not follow them, you know, and that happened to many of our people, but our people, you know, as you know, the same as you, I'm sure my girl, you know, live on both sides of the border, Anishinaabe, northern part of five American states, southern part of four Canadian provinces. It is squarely our territory, the Great Lakes territory, that is where we come from. So um, Liz Ellis has graciously ceded her question to you. Um, and we can take questions from the floor. I see that Jennifer in the back has the microphone, please. And Lily also on the other side, raise your hands, wave them high and proud. There you go. Hi. I may not have the lingo down just right, but contextually, um, why would it not be appropriate to declare war on the US? And I'll say one other thing about that. The facts show us that the US stands on bad faith, denial, and fraud systemically in place against Native people since Columbus, and now visible in the unfortunate reality of confrontation of terms that Occupy gave us in the form of the 99 versus the 1%. And we're all suffering from that. The Native people are just the, the people who know it best. And I, don't, I just don't understand in the terms that the US understands for itself why it's not appropriate to just declare war. You know, I think it, it is a political point. I, you know, our position is, is that we are nonviolent and direct action and prayerful people. And we, you know, there's a multiple set of strategies, you know, and at present you see the, you know, the, the prayer and the Gandhi approach, you know, and the Martin Luther King approach, which is one very important and, and you know, approach. You know, at the same time, we are fully aware that they are, that I do, I do not intend to sit here on the defense. And so that is why I'm saying we need to go out. You know, I, I, I hosted a gathering in Bismarck at the beginning of the week because I said we can't sit at the camp and not go after Bismarck. We have to start going after Bismarck so that people are held accountable for the decisions that is made in North Dakota so they cannot just continue to watch the media portray us as, as you know, evil doers, which is what they're trying to do and justify the increased use of force by the Borton County Sheriff and the state of North Dakota. So I, you know, I believe that we will continue our nonviolent direct action. We will count on our allies elsewhere to support us. But yet at the same time, it is time to directly challenge the state of North Dakota for its rogue behavior because that is enough. We're done. You know, so that's what I say. And North, North Dakota is well aware of my position because I've, you know, I've been at this for a while. We have a question down here in the front. Thank you. Can you see me? I can see you. Yeah, thank you. My name is Cindy Ott. I teach at, teach at University of uh, Delaware. And I'm curious what you think about the idea of the modern Indian in terms of <clears throat> a lot of people can celebrate the Indian of the past and show great reference, reference for them, but then it can be a very um, difficult to describe what the modern Indian is and so how you can move forward in time and still celebrate Indians who were in the 20th century and not just in the past. Thank you. That's such a great question, you know. It is true, people like Indians, people in a certain way, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, I mean, I, I deal with it all the time because I'm, you know, pretty much a living thing. And I, you know, I go in these places you know, and, and, you know, it can be difficult and awkward, but I'm, you know, you guys hung out with me. I'm a very reasonable person, but I also like, you know, I'm 57 years old and you can't talk to, you can't down talk to me. It just isn't going to work, you know? So, um, you know, you, you, you know, 
it it is it's it's cool to be indigenous and and our you know all our stuff is cool and we need to be honored for it and we need to be able to actualize it you know in its larger potential and um you know i think it's a funny thing because you know uh, a, a few days ago on the on the 10th is when they celebrate that columbus day and i decided that we were going to ride our horses up there to see Embridge in tioga north dakota and I didn't really realize it was Columbus Day, but we call that Indigenous Peoples Day. Or mm -hmm. Over here they call it uh, All Chiefs Day over on these reservations. So we're riding our horses, and there's about 40 of us on horseback, and we rode directly into the Embridge facility after we realized that they were all celebrating Columbus Day, and we're off. <laughs> so it was this really great social moment. I was like, I'm glad you're all shopping in Bismarck because we're here, you know, which saved me a lot of fracking trucks and probably a lot of riot police. Um, but, you know, it's this moment. The other thing I want to just say is uh, just a personal thing to you and for anyone else who is from Delaware, how the hell do all those corporations get chartered there? Can someone check on that? I mean, the, the fact is, is that almost every corporation we were fighting was chartered in Delaware. Can we not start revoking some of those corporate charters out of Delaware? As a preposterous, you know, preposterous that these corporations exist as entities with legal rights under the law as humans. And, you know, in the case of Enbridge, North Dakota Pipeline Company, they were incorporated in Delaware the day before they received their status for imminent domain in North Dakota. So, you know, I feel like, you know, I don't mean to be pick on Delaware, but for crying out loud, you know, let's get moving in Delaware. Be a super big help to the rest of us fighting corporations. <laughs> I think with that, we're going to wrap it up. And please join me in thanking our presenters and especially Winona. Thank you all.